Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of the Lords of Consciousness video cast coming to you from the sunny desert of Arizona. I am your host, Clint Culberson, and I'm really uh, excited to welcome our guest today, author Gary David, Gary, and fellow Arizonan. Gary, how are you, brother? I'm great. I'm Clint, uh, doing doing real well. It's a, a bright, sunny day here in Tucson, and uh, you know it's um, we're having uh, wonderful weather. Uh, I ate lunch outside today, so uh, all the people back east can can drool a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this is the time of year uh, why we remember why we live in the desert. So it's 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 a it's an epic place to be in the in the cold months when everyone else is freezing out, you know. And to be amongst the saguaros is a great pleasure. Of course, we'll be we'll pay in the summertime when the you know temps go up uh, one fifteen, one twenty. You know, oh, yeah. we're, we're, it's like walking into an uh, an oven. You know. <laughs> I, I always say it's peop, it's people repellent. It's uh, if 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 we didn't have the hot summers, uh, Arizona would be Southern California. So uh, oh yeah yeah. So thank yeah. goodness it gets hot to like repel the the weak. <laughs> you know, go ahead in California. Only the strong shall stay here in the hot deserts. <laughs> Gary, yeah. I, I I wanted to jump in because you have such a great uh, breadth of experience in many years looking into the indigenous tribes of, of, of North America. And specifically, you've spent time with the Lakotas in, in, in South Dakota, correct? Yes. And mm-hmm. uh, you spent a lot of time with the Hopis in Northern Arizona. And, right. you know, I, one, I think, I feel like uh, a lot of people in the West now have no idea what America was like uh, before, you know, pre-European, pre-Columbus. Uh, pre, you know, white invasion, I will call it, or whatever you want to call it, invasion. Um, you know, can you can you describe what what the tribes, what was it like during that time? There's so many tribes, and how did they interact with each other? What was their commonalities, but what were their differences? And why didn't they have one giant empire? Why did they keep it in a, in, mm-hmm. in a tribal way? Um, well, <clears throat> there are a number of different life ways or cultural uh, practices. Uh, for instance, the Hopi down in uh, this area, in the in the Four Corners area in, of the of the South, in the American Southwest, they're more agrarian. They're more of, they're they're farmers, basically farmers. They they grew corn, beans, and squash. So it's a, a very a, a sedentary kind of lifestyle, and. Uh, uh, other tribes, such as uh, tribes on the northern plains, like the Lakota and the Cheyenne, and uh, different different tribes uh, in the east, they they kind of um, they moved around a little bit. They were they were more nomadic, and um, they they went a little farther in their uh, migratory arcs. So um, it's just a basically a different different lifestyles that um, that kept the the tribes um, um, more or less um, segregated to an extent. However, a lot of the academics believe that the the tribes were they didn't get around too much. But uh, some of my research has proved that um, the, the tribes did indeed interact. You know. The, uh, the Hopi interacted with uh, uh, the tribes in the Ohio Valley region, for instance. And my new book, uh, Journey of the Serpent People, talks about this and how, um, how the Hopi may have played a part in, in building a great serpent mound in southern Ohio. So the, 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 the people got around and, you know, uh, they've found, for instance, they found uh, obsidian from Yellowstone Park in the Ohio Valley. So the tribes were getting around uh, a lot more than mainstream academia will, uh, will give them credit for. And that's really the, the, the point of my recent work. Um, it's kind of um, talking about uh, cultural diffusionism that, that is um, the cultures got around more than, um, than, than uh, 
the professors give them credit for. You know, the professors think that the tribes lived in a kind of a, had a narrow horizon that they functioned under, and they didn't go more than a couple hundred miles from their, their home base. But um, we're finding that's not true. Uh, we're finding uh, artifacts that are, are common to a lot of different regions. Um, I, we found find genetics that, um, that are common in, in uh, different regions. Uh, tribes from Ohio have, uh, have for instance, uh, genetics uh, of uh, people in Nevada, of tribal people in Nevada. You know, that's some of the research I've been going into lately. But basically, it was, um, it was a low-tech, very sophisticated society. So, you know, it's kind of a contradiction. Um, if you look at, um, for instance, the archaeoastronomy of some of the tribes, the way they looked at the heavens, the way they viewed the ancient uh, the star systems, um, they were very sophisticated in their knowledge of, um, of um, uh, you know, aligning different buildings to different stars, for instance, and uh, being very conscious of uh, the, the rising and setting of certain stars on the horizon and the sun on the horizon. Um, so uh, they lived a kind of a low tech compared to what we're used to. Um, uh, gentle on the land, uh, they didn't uh, abuse the land, they didn't uh, um, um, uh, destroy the land like we appear to be doing today. Um, but they had a very sophisticated spiritual and, um, and um, scientific um, knowledge of of the heavens and and of the earth what were their confrontations most commonly over well um they um they had disputes certain tribes got along with each other and others did not um for instance uh, sir, uh, the lakota sioux uh they were far ranging and they they got into certain territories that there there were basically territorial disputes you know and this this is not uh not a dispute that, that i own this land like we think of today it's more or less you know it's my right to hunt in this area and not your right to hunt you know so it's mm -hmm. basically a very very pragmatic kind of uh, situation where there were disputes over um over different uh, hunting areas uh, because it was very crucial that um you know the buffalo were not hunted out or you know uh, you know the, the buffalo could become scarce in, in certain areas and uh, the tribes wanted to prevent that and they wanted to kind of look over their, their basic uh, hunting area. And, you know, two tribes that come to mind again, this is why we're here to talk about, but the, the Hopi and the Navajo, for example, mm -hmm. can you kind of explain that history of those two tribes and how they, uh, how they migrated to Arizona and, and why there is a present day kind of animosity between the two yeah, tribes? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, Clint, because, um, you know, people think about the, the two tribes, they're living right together. Um, the Hopi lived in Northern Arizona on three three primary mesas and the Hopi, the Navajo reservation kind of surrounds the Hopi reservation. And it goes from, you know, it goes from uh, like the Grand Canyon area all the way in, east into New Mexico and up to the Utah border. And the Navajo, it's a huge reservation and it surrounds the Hopi reservation. And they have two very different histories. Uh, the Hopi have been, in the Southwest, in the Four Corners area, for um, for millennia, they they've been here for for thousands and thousands of years, and they they migrated around this area and built certain villages or or pueblos, um, and then they abandoned these pueblos and moved on to another place. So they they kind of marked off their territory by building these stone structures. They're kind of like stone apartment buildings. Um, and, but the Navajo have a, a completely different history. Um, many archeologists believe that the Navajo migrated from the north, from uh, 
perhaps the, the, the northwest area of the United States down into the southwest or as early as 1300 AD. So whereas the Hopi have been here for thousands of years, the Navajo and the Apache, another Athabascan language group, um, the Hopi are Udo Estecan. So they're different languages even. Uh, language groups, but the Navajo and Apache moved moved into the area fairly late, um, just before um, just before the Spanish incursion into the Southwest in the um, in the in the fourteen hundreds and fifteen hundreds. So um, uh, and there's been kind of a friction between the Navajo and the Hopi because the Hopi, uh, their traditional name, the Hopi means people of peace and the Navajo um, were seen as the um, head pounders uh, to the Hopi <laughs> people. You know, they came in and raided the Hopi villages and, you know, raided their corn and, and so forth. And um, in fact, the, the, the word Anasazi uh, is a is a word that archaeologists used to use to refer to the ancient Hopi people. Um, the uh, it, that's actually a Navajo word, which means ancient enemy. Okay, uh, archaeologists really don't use that term anymore. It was fashionable in the in the 70s and, and 80s, but now they they um they call the ancient people who built these pueblos ancestral puebloans which kind of a awkward, awkward term. Anasazi is so much more artistic and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's such a, uh, such a, uh, artistic name uh, yeah. for, for this group, pe- group of people, but, um, rolls off the tongue. Know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, it does. And the, the Hopi uh, call themselves his atsinom, his the, the, the old ones, the old people, that's their ancestors. Mm-hmm. And the ancestors are still with them. And the, the ancestors still are at the sites. So if you go to a, um, an ancient Pueblo and there's a lot of Pueblos that you can visit as national parks and nat- national monuments, you know, the ancestors of the Hopi still, still are hanging or lingering in this area. And contemporary Hopis um, often go to these places and do ceremonies to um, to meet with their ancestors and um, and um, kind of interact with with the ancient ones. Yeah, and it, that leads into uh, what I wanted to bring up next, and that is the fact that the Hopi are known as one of the most spiritually attuned uh tribes out there and, and I'm, I'm where does that reputation come from i suppose i mean obviously there's no way to prove that exactly but where does that reputation come from well um you know it i think i think each tribe would say well you know we're we're the most spiritual people of course. <laughs> <laughs> but i i think you're right i think you're right because um um, you know, I lived I lived with the uh, in South Dakota in the Black Hills of South Dakota for 15 years and taught on Pine Ridge Reservation, and kind of um, uh, did some of the ceremonies, uh, sweat lodge ceremony and pipe ceremonies, and um, um, interacted with um, some some of the Lakota people there, um, and uh, it's a it's a very spiritual uh, system that they have too. But when I moved down here to Arizona in 1994 and started going to some of the Hopi Kachina dances, and I can talk about Kachinas uh, as well, but um, some of the ceremonies on the Hopi reservation. And um, I, I realized that basically as an outsider, I could only scratch the surface of their, their religion um, because the, the Hopi are really kind of a, a very um, peaceful people, as I said, and they're very polite, but they're somewhat secretive in the way that they they deal with the outside world. And this is the way they they've survived through the ages. I mean, they're they're out there on these these mesas that uh, really have no flowing water. There are no rivers by the, you know, near where they live. Um, 
they rely on spring water and aquifers and so forth. Um, but uh, th their isolation is their salvation, I believe. Whereas um, the people like the, the Lakota, you know, famous Sioux warriors, um, they were the warrior, the warrior culture. The, they were the ones that confronted Custer when Custer um, uh, trespassed on their sacred black hills. And of course, Custer paid the price for that at the, at the Little Bighorn. So it's a, it's a different, it's a whole different uh, ethos um, that's, that's going on with the, with the two cultures. Um, but I think, um, you know, the Hopi have this reputation of being very spiritual because, um, because they're somewhat secretive and they do their ceremonies, uh, a lot of their ceremonies, um, down in what, what's called a kiva. A kiva is an underground prayer chamber that and the um the entrance to this prayer chamber is um in the subterranean or semi-subterranean and the the entrance is through the through the roof so you go down a ladder and you descend into this uh, this underground space and it's supposed to uh, symbolically represent the underworld so when you're when you're doing these ceremonies you're going down into the underworld and meet with the ancestors um in this uh, symbolic uh, underworld, which is called a kiva. And um, the kivas are, are places where um, uh, men and, and sometimes women gather, uh, especially during the winter time, and they tell stories down in these kivas. Uh, a lot of uh, winter, winter time activities are, are the story, story time. Um, December, uh, the, like the, the, the winter solstice on through, through say, March um, are, are the story time, uh, the time of where these uh, myths were told by the elders and passed on to the next generation of, um, of, of, um, of Hopis. And um, this is the way they transmitted their knowledge because the Hopi do not have any written language. Um, unlike the Maya or the Aztec, uh, the Hopi do not have a written language, so they passed on all their legends and myths through these through these stories. And um, they would be very precise in the way they told these stories because if you didn't be precise with the storytelling, then then the story would gradually change. You know, it's kind of like the telephone uh, the telephone game. Mm -hmm. You you whisper one one thing to one person, and then they whispers uh, the next. You know, it goes along the chain, and at the end of the chain, it's a totally different. Uh, uh, a totally different sentiment that that comes out. So um, part of the reason why they gathered in the kivas in the winter time is to correct these legends and make sure that they're the truthful way. It's the oral tradition, and the self-corrective nature of the oral tradition is is very important to the Hopi. So uh, that's that's part of the reason you know why they've um, they've kind of have an aura of spirituality. Mm -hmm or they, they're seen that way. Yeah, and um, one can understand why tribes like the Hopis would uh, have an element of secrecy and privacy and, and, you know, considering the history that all of the indigenous tribes have gone through. And in many ways, they could be keepers of what many Native Americans call the original teachings. And I kind of mm -hmm. wanted to get your opinion uh, on... And, uh, on what are the original teachings? Can you summarize what that is? Because I, I hear about that a lot, and I've ha I've heard certain uh, renditions of it, and I'm just curious what you've seen. Well, a lot of a lot of uh, Hopi and and also Zuni. I have a, a Zuni friend named uh, Clifford Mahudi. Uh, he's he's a, also a Pueblo uh, person from Z Zuni, New Mexico, and he says that the original teachings came from the star from the star ancestors, from the star people, and they they came down and interacted with with the uh, various tribes in the region, the the Hopis, the Zuni, the Acoma, the Laguna, and all the the various tribes, the Tewa and the Tiwa along the Rio Grande. Uh, in New Mexico, all those all those tribes are, are Pueblo people, and they have similar traditions 
that um, that point to the stars, that point to the heavens as being the source of their original teachings. The ancestors came down. Um, the Hopi have, um, I mentioned Kachinas before, and the Kachinas are, um, are kind of, um, they're analogous to angels in uh, Christian, uh, Christian thinking um, uh, system. Um, they're they're go-betweens between the, the realm of the humans and the realm of the gods or the or God. Okay, the Kachinas come down to the people and interact with the people, and the Hopi still have um, they still have these Kachina dances every year um, in the village plazas. There's a Kachina season that starts um, during the winter solstice. That's when it begins. And it runs through the agricultural season through February, March, April, May, into the summertime and past the summer solstice and into July. And then the final Kachina dance is held in July, sometime in July. It depends on which village you go to. There are about 12 different villages on the three primary mesas. But um, um, so it, it lasts about half of a year going from the winter solstice to past the summer solstice. And then the Kachinas um, leave the mesas because the, the agriculture, they've helped with the agriculture throughout the season of, of planting and, um, and um, into, the, into the fall uh, when, when the, the, the reaping is uh, apparent, the, the picking of corn and so forth. But, but the Kachinas leave um, the mesas, and they they are said to live in the San Francisco peaks, um, which are around Flagstaff. They're the highest mountains in Arizona. Uh, Humphreys Peak is, is the highest point in Arizona. And this is where the Kachinas live during like half the year, okay? And then they migrate back to the, the Hopi mesas after the winter solstice. And they, they hang around there. And then in July, it's, it's called the Niman dance. It's a very beautiful dance because the, the Hopi have these, um, I, should, I should mention that the Kachinas wear these masks, okay? These, these um, very bizarre, um, colorful, masks that are that are they're hard to describe because there's so many different types of kachinas there are literally um hundreds and hundreds of different types of kachinas and they all that a kachina basically can represent any uh, spiritual force in the universe it might be a plant might be an animal might be a non-human entity and a lot of these kachinas, their masks look like um, space helmets. In fact, you know they they have kind of slits for eyes, and they have they're they're uh, cylindrical. And uh, so, um, you know, if you've seen some of these kachina dolls that the Hopi carve, um, you get an idea of what a kachina looks like. And um, the the dolls or or tihu, um, they've they were carved as um, instructive tools for the children so that the so the children could recognize the different types of kachinas because like i said uh, there are literally hundreds of different types of kachinas and it, it's hard to you know it's it's hard to know uh which kachina uh, enters the village plaza you know unless you unless you uh, are familiar with the dolls you know beforehand mm -hmm. so um um it's a, it's a very a very complex religion that it's and it's a ceremonial cycle that takes a lot of energy of of the Hopi people because uh, you know the Hopi now are preparing for uh, summertime rituals so they they have certain things that they have to do certain uh, prayer feathers that they have to make uh, during the winter time in order to use them in the summertime so you know it's an ongoing it's an ongoing kind of cycle ceremonial cycle that the Hopi um, uh, carry on and um, it's uh, unfortunately it's getting kind of um, it's harder and harder to carry on this cycle because a lot of the young people are leaving to get jobs in Phoenix and uh, other other places you know Flagstaff and um, it, the, the language is not being learned as it used to be learned so 
there's a kind of a, a devolution of, uh, of, of cultural knowledge in that respect that uh, gradually um, the, Hopi, the Hopi ideas and legends and myths and uh, ceremonial duties, they're being forgotten. And um, it's, it's kind, of, kind of a sad thing, but um, the Hopi say this is part of um, the end of the, of the fourth world. Hmm. Um, you know, we're living in at the end at, um, well, in, in the Christians call it the end times, but the Hopi say we're at the end of the fourth world. And many Hopi I've talked to say that, yeah, we're, we're pretty close to it. And there, there are a lot of different signs, um, that the, the end of this world age is drawing to a close. Um, but the Hopi, as I said, you know, it's the fourth world and they've gone through the creation and destruction of three previous worlds. Um, the first world um, was a um, kind of a, like a paradise and um, animals and humans interacted almost uh, on a shamanic basis and, and every, every, every human uh, could communicate with animals and there was a close, there was, it was like the web of life in, in the first world. But there was a devolution of the culture. Uh, people got corrupted, they got selfish. Um, there were, there were um, some, um, some sexual and social uh, degradations that caused the whole culture to kind of devolve. And that's when uh, the, the great spirit or um, uh, Tawa is the name of the, uh, the sun god and is thought of as a great spirit that decided that the first world should end. And Tawa brought a, a fire down upon the land. Now fire, we could think of as something like um, a comet or asteroid strike or you know, just um, uh, maybe volcanism connected with that. Um, but the first world um, was destroyed by fire. But a few, a few Hopis survived this by going down into caverns and caves. Um, and uh, it's, it's kind of funny because <clears throat> they were taken down into these caves by what they call the ant people. Now the ant people, um, I see petroglyphs of the ant people, and they they do look rather insectoid. You know, they're they're they do look like insects, and they have antennas and you know, kind of big eyes and and spindly spindly legs and arms. But they're they're humanoid. They they look like humans, mm. but 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 in another sense, they look like insects. You know, the, but the ant people were benevolent people, uh, and they. <clears throat> They took the Hopi down into caverns and caves, and they helped them survive this cataclysm of uh, the the first world being destroyed. And um, in fact, there's a uh, there's a ceremony that's held in in February called the Pawamu, and they go down uh, the, the Hopi go down into the kibas, which I explained before. And the, they go down into the underworld, um, and um, they they sprout these beans in the kivas and this commemorates a time that the ant people taught the hopi how to sprout these beans down in the caves and caverns and of course there are many caves and caverns in the grand canyon area that that brings up a lot of um a lot of feelings to the hopi because the hopi believe that they just they came up from the third world into the fourth world up uh, through a a place called the Sipapuni or Sipapu, okay? Now there's a symbolic Sipapu in every kiva. It's a little hole in the floor that represents the place that they emerged from. But as far as um, the, the, um, the Sipapuni is concerned, the Hopi believe that they emerged from this, this one spot in the Grand Canyon. And this is a, an actual geological feature that you can see on Google Earth. And if, you, if you're a Google Earther, you can go um, you know, to the north bank of the Little Colorado, a few miles from the juncture of the main Colorado River, and, and find this geological structure. It's called a travertine dome. 
it's a kind of a limestone dome. It's a, it's about 75 to 100 feet across, and there's a there's a hole right in the middle of it, and it's got, and it was built up through uh, years and years of mineral water. Okay, uh, the mineral water built up this this huge dome, um, and you can see it from from the satellite photos. Uh, you can see these uh, this this structure that the Hopi claim that they came up out of the Grand Canyon from this particular spot. And it's, it's probably the most sacred spot um, in all of Hopi land. Um, but the, the Hopi came up from the third world into, into the current fourth world and um, started to inhabit the Colorado Pla Plateau, which is um, you know Arizona and New Mexico area. Are non-Hopis um, permitted uh, to go to that, the to that sacred spot in the Grand Canyon? Uh, yeah, you can, you can go, uh, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of people take a, a raft trip down, uh, down river and, and go to this juncture and then walk just a mile or so. I've never been there, but, um, they walk a mile or so, uh, um, up the Colorado, the little Colorado river. It's, um, and you can get down that way. Um, there's a, a apparently a, a real rough trail going from the rim from uh, the rim um, on the north side going going down to this same spot and the Hopi the Hopi used to to make annual migrations they're called it was called the salt trail and they they take this particular trail down to the Sipapuni where there are also salt caves down there and they they gather ritual salt to take back um, to do to use in their in their ceremonies on the on the Hopi Mesa. So uh, a lot of the the Hopi spirituality is connected to the Grand Canyon itself. It's it's um, if if you've ever been to the Grand Canyon, you know how how just powerful it is. I mean, you can you can sit on the the edge of the Grand Canyon and um, just feel the waves of energy coming out of this place if you're still enough you know if there are not too many tour buses going by and <laughs> disturbing the, the peace of the place you can you could actually you know feel the waves of energy just just waving just wafting over you to sit on the edge of the canyon and hopefully don't fall in but <laughs> the, the the hopis uh talk about a great purification that could come in the this you know the end of the fourth age. Can you speak yeah. to that? Well, um, you know, there's so many different traditions of um, of the purification and um, different ideas about Hopi prophecy. You know, I I I see Hopi prophecy, the Hopi having kind of a legacy of prophecy. I mean, they've been talking about certain world events that have happened um, as signs or omens or, or you know, just particular um, signposts that, that signal the end of the current fourth world. Um, so, you know, some of these are natural signs like uh, increased um, uh, earth, earthquakes like we just had um, this morning, you know, off of the coast of Alaska, uh, mm. the increase of that sort of thing, increased um, hurricanes and flooding and just um, natural chaos that's taking place. It's really, um, it's really Mother Earth uh, um, just striking back at us, you know, and, and um, trying to uh, push us, uh, you know, say you're you're not doing what you should be doing to take care of the planet. Um, yeah, so. Um, there, there are natural, <clears throat> natural chaos um, events going on. There are also uh, human events. Um, for instance, um, one of the events was um, one of the prophecies is uh, the the ocean will turn black, <clears throat> will turn black, and all the the sea mammals will die. You know, in this. so we had that a few years the the, um, the Gulf oil spill. You know, where, where a lot of the the uh, Gulf of New Mexico was defiled. So that's, um, the, and the Hopi began to to bring out these prophecies, their various prophecies, um, around the mid 20th century, because the Hopi saw that uh, the the um, atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, 
And they had a prophecy that, uh, and this is, you know, hundreds of years old, this particular prophecy, that a gourd of ashes will fall upon the earth and uh, will poison everyone. Okay. So when the Hopi saw that um, we dropped the, the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they said that, yes, this is our this, this is our prophecy coming true that the, the fourth world is um, coming to a close. And they tried to go to the, the UN. Um, they called the UN the House of Mica because it, it kind of looks like Mica, this clear, clear glass, um, you know, glass like rock. You know, they call it the House of Mica. And a lot of Hopi elders in the like the, in the 60s and 70s uh, addressed the UN and tried to say, you know, tried to say, well, we're not, we're not living. Uh, <laughs> in a spiritual way uh, we're living contrary to the ways of the creator so you know the, um, but they were of course they were ignored because they these are only you know savages you know <laughs> so uh, you know they they were they were, they said their piece and went went back to arizona and that's that was that but um they they were compelled to go um at least four times to the un and they did that but whether whether it did any good, I'm 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 not sure because, you know, some of these um, some of these signs um, that um, that the end of the fourth world um, they're they're coming they're coming to pass, and um, there's a particular rock that um, it's called Prophecy Rock, and it's you can you can Google uh, just Google Hopi and Prophecy Rock, and you'll see a picture of Prophecy Rock. It's a very famous petroglyph on the Hopi Reservation, and it kind of uh, charts out the symbolically the, the what we're facing in this in the end of the fourth world. And there are two uh, uh, diagonal parallel lines uh, carved into this rock. And the lower the lower line has um, it looks like people farming, you know, growing corn along this line. So there are figures growing corn, and then there uh, the parallel line above it, um, going this way. Um, there there are people with um, um, the Hopi call these the two hearts, um, and one figure actually has two heads. So you know. Um, the, they're the they're the ones that are kind of destroying the earth. You know, they're they're the ones that um, are living contrary to the ways of the Creator, and um, they are the ones bringing on the end of the fourth world. And it's interesting that um, these two parallel lines, one of them, um, the top one where these these um, destroyers are, the two-hearted ones, that the line ends in a kind of a zigzag. And then stops in space, like it's just floating in space. But the lower line, the the, the one, the true Hopi way, it goes, and then there's the rock kind of goes off uh, at a corner angle, but the line keeps going uh, around the side of the rock. So the lower line keeps going, but the upper line stops. So it's symbolic of the end of the fourth world, but the lower line keeps going. And um, I... I um, met with grandfather martin gesh wesioma he's um he he passed on uh, a couple years ago and he was the keeper of prophecy rock and um he 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 talked to us about uh, prophecy rock and and the meaning of prophecy rock and um he's from Hope villa on on third mesa and uh, he said that sometimes he would go to the prophecy rock and see that this line that went this lower line that went that continued on the other face of the rock was was dis, had disappeared and then other days he'd come and it was back there so you know this you know there's it's almost like he was saying well you know it's not a sure thing that the the world will go on so you know um, the the true the true nature of Hopi uh, Hopi society and language and culture. It's not certain that this this will continue, but uh, he was pretty positive. He he kept saying, "Keep going, keep going." That's that's the way to confront um, all the chaos that we're seeing in the world right now. I suppose if it was 
absolutely certain uh, it wouldn't be as fun. So I'm, I'm, I, I guess I'm grateful for the, those those moments of despair where you think it's all over, you know, for humanity, you know, or the, the whole planet's going to uh, go down in a blaze of glory. Um, yet I, I feel like there's such a light that's emerging from the world and even the Hopis themselves have come out of their secrecy a bit to share some of this uh, these original teachings with the world and with the Western world, with, you know, with all cultures. And I, I, I think many, many indigenous tribes around the world seem to be simultaneously doing this. Can you speak to that and what purpose and, and uh, why the secrecy has been broken a bit? Well, as far as I hope he goes, uh, like I said, um, they saw the, the atomic bombs in, in the mid 20th century go off. And I said, well, this is, we've, we've got to come out. And, and some of the elders were resistant to, to bringing out the sacred knowledge because they'd never done it before. And, um, you know, in the, in the early 20th century, the Hopi said, well, we could let some of these um, non Hopis onto the reservation and see our, our ceremonies, but uh, they, they were abused. They, they didn't respect the ceremonies that the Hopi were doing, uh, in particular, the the snake dance, which is a non-Kachina dance, um, was very popular with tourists in the early 20th century. Um, so they, they had a you know just um, that tourists would go up from from the Winslow area and 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 drive up there by automobile and um, and uh, just. Um, just watch the watch the Hopis um, put uh, rattlesnakes in their mouths, which is one of the ceremonies that um, that takes place in in um, every other August up there. But uh, like I said, the the Hopi finally got fed up with you know them not um, the non non Hopis not respecting the culture and the the seriousness of of the ceremonies going on. And you, you know, you still see that to an extent today, though a lot of people are, are uh, realize um, with, you know, the knowledge that's, that's um, being distributed uh, through various means that these are serious sacred ceremonies mm -hmm. and, and you shouldn't, it's, it's not entertainment. It's, it's, it's not like, a, it's not like a powwow, you know, a, a powwow is a different, it's a powwow is a, a dance, um, a dance setting, but um, it's it's not a, not really a sacred uh, sacred dancing. But uh, but the Hopi, when they do the especially the Kachina dances and the snake dances, these are very sacred uh, ceremonies that um, that you, it should be like going going into a church that you approach it with uh, solemnity and and uh, sobriety and so forth. So um, but. Um, you know the Hopi, uh, the Hopi believe that um, we had to come out with this information, and you know the Lakota up in South Dakota were the same way. Um, what really got me started on this whole thing about as above, so below, um, this, the stars reflecting the earth. Um, I met a, a Lakota woman named Charlotte Black Elk. And she she um, is the great granddaughter of the famous Nicholas Black Elk, who wrote Black Elk Speaks, uh, a, f a famous uh, Native American classic about Black Elk's vision on on the top of Harney Peak. But but Charlotte was uh, when I met her, she was um, coming out with the information about how the the uh, Lakota used to migrate around the Black Hills and make a, an annual circle around the Black Hills at various sites in the Black Hills to do a particular ceremony at a particular time of year. And they wound up at, um, at uh, Devil's Tower, which is, is famous for uh, you know, close encounters of, of the third kind, of course. Uh, but um, they saw this as, as the Sundance place. Um, and um, the Charlotte uh, had a buffalo hide, and it was a star map on this buffalo hide, and she was trying to prove that the Lakota were in that region far earlier than uh, traditional academics gave them credit for. Um, uh, many, many scholars believe that the, the Sioux moved from the Minnesota area into um, into the 
the Black Hills area in Western South Dakota about 1700. Uh, but but Charlotte was saying on the proving on this this buffalo hide uh, star map that no we we knew about precession of the equinoxes and the way that the stars are positioned uh, on this particular map proves that we we were here thousands of years ago in this region so we've been here far longer than just a couple hundred years you know so that that's really got me started on this whole idea of as above so below because she said that the Black Hills, uh, which um, it's a beautiful place. That, uh, a lot of you know that um, Mount Rushmore is located in the Black in the Black Hills, and uh, they're also carving uh, the Crazy Horse Monument there um, in the Black Hills. But um, the Black Hills represent um, a great buffalo um, on the earth, and this buffalo is also in the sky. The buffalo uh, is is made up of various stars in in um, it's a huge constellation as as far as the Lakota go um, the backbone of this buffalo is Orion's belt the the nose of the buffalo is the Pleiades in um, in Taurus okay and the tail of the buffalo is is the star Sirius so and there are different uh, different um, spots in the Black Hills that correspond to these particular stars. So the Lakota made this, this uh, migration around the area and doing these ceremonies at particular times of year, you know, um, and they were uh, giving homage to these particular stars and the star ancestors that came down from these stars to teach them the ancient ways. Yeah, you know, that correlates so perfectly with your work that you're probably most known for is your or Orion correlation with the three sacred sites uh, on the Hope, on, on Hopi land. You know, right. in, 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 the, in the same regards that Robert Boval found the Orion correlation with the Giza pyramids. You know, and obviously this is a huge, huge topic and you have books written about it. But can you describe the significance of of this correlation and really how did they know about it? I mean, I know that's the, yeah. the, the big, the big uh, bajillion big dollar question, question but <laughs> how, can, just describe the significance first of the correlation with, with Orion. Sure. Um, yeah. I, you mentioned Robert Bouval. I, I first, you know, read his book in, um, in 1997. It came out, I think in 95 or something like that, 94 or maybe. And, um, you know, I was um, read that, you know, and the, the three major pyramids on the Giza Plateau correspond to um, Orion's belt, according to the uh, to his theory. And I was driving up from Winslow to the Hopi Reservation and going to a, a Kachina dance on the Hopi Reservation. And I saw these three mesas on the horizon, on the northern horizon. And I began to, you know, you're, you're out there in the middle of nowhere, so to speak, and you're you're, um, you know, just traveling along, and um, and I, I started dreaming. Well, maybe there's an Orion correlation right here in Arizona. You know, I was just kind of being whimsical, and I, th I think, well, maybe that's true. Maybe these three mesas I'm going up to, maybe they correspond to Orion's belt. So I put that idea in the back of my mind, and then I went up to the Kachina dances and watched the dances, and then came back home, and I got out a sky chart, and I got out a map of Arizona, and, and started comparing the two. And, and I found that not only were the, the three primary mesas, and they're evenly spaced out on the land, they're, they're about um, seven miles apart, and they're evenly spaced, like Orion's belt, but not only that, there were other other um, sites that corresponded to every major star in the constellation. So I found that there was a, a, a sky Earth relationship between every every star and every site, uh, either a um, a place that the Hopi are currently living, like the the mesas, the three mesas, or an ancient site like uh, Wupatki in uh, north of Flagstaff, or um, a Navajo National Monument, which is actually a, a um, ancient Hopi site, 
in uh, Canyon de Chez is another site, and uh, Homolavi State Park is, is another ancient Pueblo uh, village. And all these, you know, if you if you go to my website, theorionzone.com, and there, right at the top, there's a, a link to maps. And you can see pretty clearly how this is laid out on, on the land, you know, how this uh, template uh, is laid out on the Arizona desert. And um, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the constellation Orion and and the um, the way these sites, the, mm. the pattern of these sites on the desert. It's just, you know, it just blew me away. And it's and like I say, it was 1997, and I started going to all these sites and researching them in depth. And um, and uh, then my first book, The Orion Zone, came out in 2005 originally, and then again in 2006. Um, so it took me a while to get going on, on you know, to, uh, a few years to research all this, this information that I was receiving um, and intuiting that um, the, the Hopi um, actually had this pattern. Now, uh, the, the question remains, how did they do it? How did they know? precisely they put this pattern on the desert and that's that's kind of a stick sticky sticky wicket you know it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's hard to, it's hard to say you know i have a few uh, a few ideas about it um there was a a god named masau um now this god um this god um uh, looks uh, to put it bluntly this god looks like an extraterrestrial gray okay um, it's got, um, a large, large head, um, big round eyes, big, uh, round mouth. Um, he, he's a really spooky looking dude and he's the God of, of the underworld and the God of the earth plane. And that's the first God that the Hopi encountered when they came up out of the Sipapuni, uh, from the third world into the fourth world. That's the first uh, entity that they encountered in the, on this earth plane. And um, I'm, I'm thinking that uh, this god Masao told them, directed them where to build their villages. You know, that's one idea because this god, you know, actually does look like one of the tall greys. In fact, the the word Masao, M-A-S, is the root word that actually means gray in Hopi language. So the skin is gray, and you know, and uh, it's, it's pretty evident if you. Um, if you uh, read descriptions of this particular mm -hmm. god that the Hopi have provided, um, that's that's one idea um, that uh, this pattern might have uh, taken shape through via um, Miss Masso's direction. Another idea is that um, the the Hopi also have this concept of flying shields. The flying shields that the Kachinas piloted and came down to Earth and interacted with the people, and actually, in some cases, took Hopi women and mated with, with uh, Hopi women. So this this sounds very familiar with the uh, the Nephilim and um, that that whole biblical thing going on. You know, be the the sons of God mating with the daughters of men. Um, it's the same thing happened in the Hopi culture that these Kachinas came down and mated with um, some of the Hopi women. So the, the Hopi the Hopi culture has, the bloodlines have have a sacred Kachina blood in them, you know. <laughs> so, um, but um, there are stories of, of being, of, of some Hopis being taken up into these flying craft, these uh, Paatuvota, they're, they're called, or Paatuvata. Um, um, so the, the, the Hopi are very familiar with these, these flying craft, and it's possible that they were taken up above the earth so they could see, so they could get a kind of a satellite view of, of the earth and, and, um, and make the, the pattern, uh, construct the pattern that way. So, you know, there, it's really an, an enigma that, uh, how this pattern, uh, turned out the way it did but you know in, in my book mirrors of orion my previous book i talk about the different different places in the world that this this constellation orion is mirrored on the earth um it's um, 
in Mexico, north of Mexico, Teotihuacan. Mm -hmm. There are three great pyramids that uh, reflect the belt stars. Uh, there's one in Scotland. I've, I've found a, um, an Orion correlation in Syria. I found one in Nigeria, um, in, in South Africa. Uh, I went to South Africa in 2009, and a friend of mine down there found um, these these stone carved stones that form the belt stars of Orion. Mm. So, um, you know, you see this this motif going through a lot of different cultures in a lot of different ages. That uh, Orion is an important constellation. And I think that it's important because because the, the star ancestors came from this place, you know, and from from Orion. Um, some mentioned the Pleiades, but the, the Pleiades are also important in, in Hopi and also Sirius. The, these three constellations basically are very important to, to the Hopi and a lot of different tribes across the, the U.S. And, and really across the world. You know, they seem to focus on um, Taurus with the Pleiades and Orion and Sirius. They have various legends uh, that a lot of them have to do with hunting, which is which is interesting because Orion is the hunter, you know, in Greek mythology. But you see this hunting motif uh, carried on through a lot of different cultures across the globe. Yeah, and you know, it, it seems like human history, uh, especially over the last you know several thousand years, has has been this um, this battle against the old way of living against this new way of techno you know way of living where it's technology driven um it's you know let's create machines and let's you know go to the go to this electronic world that we're all in right now in fact um i'm grateful for it to some extent because obviously we're having this conversation because of it exactly yeah. and uh it's yet yeah, it's so vital i i feel like to understand the the way humans used to live and to understand where we come from like how did our ancestors live and at the yeah. end of the day we are all related <laughs> and, and and you know oh, yeah. you go back far enough in the tree and we're you know you and me are hopies uh on yeah, on yeah, some yeah. level and, you know, and of course, this is a conversation between two, two uh, you know, European, uh, 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 you know, Euro two American Europeans talking about uh, what, you know, the culture of, of the Native Americans are. And so obviously take that with a grain of salt on, on of course, right. on some yeah, level. Yeah. I, I, I always try to keep a distance and saying, you know, I'm not trying to be. Uh, I'm not part of the Wanabi tribe. You mm -hmm. know, I don't want to be an Indian. You yeah, know? yeah. <laughs> I, I'm just, you know, living on this land. I've, I've lived in Arizona since 1994 and before that 15 years in, in South Dakota. And so I've, I've lived most of my adult life in among native native places yeah. um, with large native populations. And, you know, this is the cultures fascinate me and their their ancient knowledge is is important to, to our time, too. You know, I think we we need. Um, we need to know this, this, and incorporate this in our spiritual values and 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 life ways. Um, I think that uh, certain a certain portion of humanity will will become transhuman, uh, transhumanism, you know, and uh, become cyborg, and you know, just a kind of. Uh, branch off into another species almost where I think as some will want to to live uh, according to the spiritual value values of the ancestors mm -hmm. of the ancient people which includes Native Americans and uh, you know native peoples all over the world yeah and maybe it's just a question of uh, low tech versus high tech in some ways you know and I think maybe that's uh, what the archaic revival is that Terrence McKenna and I always bring it up because I do believe that's the process that we are involved in right now is an archaic revival. We're going back to where we once had it best, you know, and then and then it doesn't mean that we're going to live exactly that way, but then start from there. And that's a good way to always uh, find yourself when you're lost, you know, go back to a place where you actually had it and then just go ahead from that point. And I yeah, do there's, believe there's it's... So 
so much wisdom there in the in the archaic uh, point of view and and shamanism in particular, um, the shamanistic way of of dealing with the world is is totally different than say Western medicine. You know, Western medicine is, is helpful and we can use that. But um, the shaman uh, also is important to go into the spiritual world to, to find underlying uh, causes of, of maladies and, and different um, different diseases that that uh, we're beset with in this uh, in this technological age. You know, yeah. um, I think um, the shaman finds the spiritual reason for cancer and heart disease and so forth, not just not just the physical uh, reasons uh, that Western medicine that it's useful to an extent but i think we, we could merge uh, both absolutely absolutely i think and that's what's happening and what you know which technologies benefit us you know in in the greater whole and which ones uh you know when i say the greater whole obviously i mean that the entire planet so all living yeah. beings the entire web you know how does is this uh, symbiotic with the entire web. Okay, great. That one's a good one. This one, nope. We're gonna we're gonna get rid of that one. So, and maybe that'll be the process that this you know this fifth age will be uh, what we figure out and truly live to a, a, a potential that I don't think any of us can really conceptualize. I think it goes beyond the event horizon of what the what the potential of you know human beings really are and. I think yeah. it's uh, again this merging of the past and and the present, and and them coming together in this polarized duality that we live in, and and giving birth to something far more beautiful. And and those who aren't on board with that, maybe that's what the great purification will be. I don't know. I I'm not here to say you know it's some sort of, you know, harvest where if you're evil you're gonna burn in hell. Like I, maybe it is. I don't. I, hell if I know. But something tells me that the the universe is ready to move on and move forward, and this this old age don't don't work no more. And Gary, yeah, I just I, want I just want to thank you so much for coming on, man. I really really good. appreciate the knowledge I, you're sharing is so vital, and I I hope we let's let's do this again because I think okay, you have great, you have great. so much to talk about, and there's just so I mean there's just an, an endless topics and uh, learning from our past uh, that that are so vital right now. So. I just want to thank well, you. You. Can, you. You can get my books on the Orionzone.com. Um, there are links to a lot of stuff. Everything's on Amazon, and you can you can find out. And a lot of free downloads. I'm just not trying to promote my books. You can download articles for free that I've written, and uh, and uh, there are a lot of articles there that you can you can check out. So the Orionzone.com is is the place you can you find out a little bit more what I've been doing for the last twenty some years. Beautiful. Yeah, you have a, an, a, a beautiful array of work and uh, you've just you have a very objective way of talking. And I, like you said, it's, you're not coming uh, at it from, you know, some white white boy who converted to the Hopi religion. It's not that you, you've been an objective observer and you're here to your great liaison between two worlds. And I appreciate you for your work. Well, thank, thank you. you. I appreciate that. Thank you, my friend. Thanks, Clint.